We probably all heard the news about nuclear fusion. Some of us, like me, had only a vague idea, being not a physicist. Physics 101 was a long time ago <laughs> for me. Um, nuclear fission was the preeminent scientific uh, event of the 20th century. Um, whether fusion is going to be the same for the 21st century, maybe most of us are, will not be around to know, but it is going to be very interesting to find out, one, what it is, and also why, compared to smashing atoms, maybe sticking atoms together is a lot more difficult. <laughs> okay. And please go ahead, Jerry. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, great. So uh, uh, today, as many of you probably oh. know, is my birthday. Uh, oh yes, and turn off yourself. Yes, yes, yes. We don't want to interrupt Jerry. And, and uh, I'll, I'll let you in on the fact that it's my 88th birthday. So, so, so uh, we'll be talking about fusion today, and this uh, thing I put in, uh, uh, showed in the title. Uh, is two examples of fusion. Uh, one is the sun uh, shining away uh, uh, happily uh, uniting hydrogen atoms into helium and making energy for us. And the other is a hydrogen bomb, uh, somewhat less pleasant uh, form uh, of energy, but nevertheless something that uh, convinces you the process takes place. Uh, and uh, as uh, we, uh, I said in, in, or we said in the announcement, uh, fusion, it's very difficult. It's actually not difficult to understand at all. It's very easy to understand. What you'll find is it's just really hard to do uh, here, here on Earth. So, ta-da! This, this whole business, uh, the idea of this talk, uh, came up with an announcement made last month. Uh, by the Department of Energy, uh, and they announced that the, uh, uh, there was an achievement of fusion ignition at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory uh, at their uh, uh, NIF, National Ignition <coughs> Facility. Uh, it was deemed a major scientific breakthrough, decades in the making, certainly that part is true, uh, uh, that will pave the way for the advancements of national defense and the future of clean power. I, I, I think we'll have to take a look at that more critically. Uh, the uh, Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, said it's a landmark achievement for the researchers and staff at NIF, the National Existing Facility, who've dedicated their careers to seeing fusion ignition become a reality. Uh, and we'll as she said, spark even more discovery. Uh, the Biden-Harris administration is committed to serving our, supporting our worldwide scientists like the team at NIF and so on and so forth. So there's a great deal of hoopla uh, over this uh, uh, particular uh, 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 announcement. And uh, <coughs> let's just see what it was that was actually achieved. So uh, the, the experiment at, LIF, uh, at NIF uh, super, su surpassed a fission threshold, fusion threshold for the first time by offering up more energy than was actually delivered to the system. So they put in 2.05 million joules of energy into this fusion target and out came 3.15 megajoules of fusion energy. So it was the first time uh, that, uh, that in after actually what was 12 years of work that these people were finally able to get more energy uh, out uh, than, uh, than energy in. Uh, and then it said many advanced science and technology developments are still needed to achieve simple, affordable uh, inertial fusion energy to power homes and businesses. 
you're going to see that's an incredible understatement. <laughs> and, and, and the Department of Energy is currently restarting a broad-based coordinated inertial f fusion energy program in the United States. Combined with private sector investment, uh, there is a lot of momentum, watch out for that word, uh, <laughs> to drive ra rapid progress, progress towards fusion commercialization. So, do uh, uh, <clears throat> a bit of history and a, a, a tiny bit of physics. Uh, the, the, the idea that you actually could start dealing with the nucleus uh, of atoms isn't something that really started happening in any real way till the last half of the 20th century. Uh, with ex accelerators and various other ways of uh, a a examining nuclear structure. Uh, <clears throat> it was recognized, of course, that there was a great deal more energy tied up in the nucleus than there was in, in atoms. Roughly, there's a million times more energy tied up in a nucleus. Uh, and you can understand that roughly because a nucleus is roughly a million times smaller. And uh, conversely, what you might think, the smaller things are, the more energy it takes to investigate them. Uh, and uh, the more energy they have to have to keep them, hold themselves together. <clears throat> so, uh, it's not easy to get, as I said, at the nucleus of an atom, much less control the release of energy tied, tied up there. Nevertheless, World War II, and much of it was driven by the war and its aftermath, produced two means of tapping into that energy. The first that was exploited was uh, termed fission, and the second was fusion. The energy could be exp exploited explosively in weapons or hopefully under more controlled conditions to pro provide a vast supply of energy for peaceful use. As you know, a nuclear weapon was employed twice at the end of World War II, and the, tr the threat of mutually assured destruction uh, concluded a cold war between the United States uh, and the Soviet Union. The figures below just uh, indicate some of the features of fission and fusion, and, and you, you'll see that it actually involves the fission of the very heaviest uh, nuclei and the fusion of the very lightest. So here is a table of all the isotopes, starting with hydrogen down here and going all the way up to lead. Those are the, that's the last really stable nucleus. And out here, these black dots that you see are the two isot uh, the three isotopes of uranium that uh, you can. Uh, uh, fine because their lifetime is roughly the age of the of, of the earth uh, and that one down there is Neptunium uh, and the energy comes from breaking these guys up and when because they're far more neutron rich when they break up uh, they end you up down here it very neutron rich uh, nuclei of half their half their mass and these things then have to decay back to being stable nuclei. So the, the fission of these heaviest isotopes has a very nasty consequence that you necessarily generate a lot of radioactivity. <coughs> On the other hand, if you can put together the very lightest of these nuclei, particularly in going from hydrogen uh, to uh, the nucleus of helium, uh, that nucleus which had made up of two neutrons and two protons, and is often called an alpha particle. Uh, there is a big gain in energy in doing that, uh, uh, in putting deuterium and, uh, and deuterium, which is uh, a hydrogen isotope made up of a proton and a neutron, and tritium, which is a radioactive species of hydrogen. It's one uh, proton and two neutrons, and it has a half-life of about 13 years. Uh, and if you can put those two things together, 
The decay product is the nucleus of helium, an alpha particle, plus a neutron, and 17 million, roughly 17 million volts uh, of energy. So there's a big energy gain. The real problem in this thing, as you can see, is if you are really accomplishing this, what you're making is really a very, very energetic neutron source. So you've got uh, <coughs> neutrons with very high energy coming out of this reaction uh, when, it, uh, when it works. So uh, as I said, the, the lightest nucleus of the hydrogen atom is usually just a single proton. Uh, somewhat rarer, uh, 15 uh, hundredths of a percent uh, is deuterium, and that's a proton and a neutron, and tritium is a proton and two neutrons. Tritium is unstable and has a half-life, as I said, of something, uh, the order of uh, 12 million years. At the other end of the nuclear chain, there are a few very heavy nuclei that are unstable with half-lives on the order of the age of the universe, uh, which is four and a half billion years. So they can be mined. That's uranium, uh, 238, 235. Uh, and together, they can uh, provide you with the basis for a nuclear, uh, for a nuclear reactor. So there I show the interaction of deuterium plus tritium going to uh, an alpha particle plus a neutron and that energy. The reason that, you, that that's a little tough to do, to make that reaction go, you have to overcome the repulsive force from the, both of those things are positively charged, the deuterium and tritium, and light charges repel, so you have to give it enough energy to overcome that repulsion. And the problem is, is when you make, have to give something a lot of energy, it wants to tend to come apart. So the problem is getting enough energy uh, to make this reaction go, and yet keeping the stuff together for a long enough time, uh, or in the case of the sun, where it has the magnificent property of gra uh, the gravity of the total mass of the sun is just holding the stuff together. So that uh, is why it's so easy to do uh, in, in the sun. The sun uh, readily uh, can do that. Uh, and and uh, on Earth, it's going to be much tougher to combine that stuff, as you'll see. Deuterium is plentiful. And, and uh, the products of DT fusion are either stable or, or short-lived. On, on the other hand, in the case of nuclear fission, you have a very heavy nucleus, and all you need is a neutron. If a neutron uh, is incident on uranium, it breaks it up into two roughly equal pieces, uh, generating 200 million volts of energy and a couple of neutrons. And those couple of neutrons, of course, can propagate further, make more fissions, and you have a chain reaction. So the, uh, uh, in, in that case, no energy needs to be uh, needed. Your whole job with a, with a fission reactor is just to keep it under control and be able to extract the energy from it and then somehow deal with the long-lived radioactive products that uh, that uh, result from it, that result from it. <coughs> so <clears throat> the idea that you could uh, actually uh, uh, make uh, fusion take place uh, inertially uh, with, with uh, uh, something uh, in a lab uh, came about uh, with a recognition in the hydrogen bomb that if you have a DT mixture and trigger it with a fusion weapon, those, that's what the early hydrogen bombs that we made were, that photon pressure, the x-rays that come out of that, are able to drive the, uh, uh, that reaction, the deuterium-tritium reaction, uh, to go uh, and cause fusion and with enough stuff present, you can make uh, a bomb out of it. 
Uh, so the idea was you had to be able somehow to make a very, very large flux uh, of photons, that is of light, uh, in, in, or if you were going to uh, uh, create uh, inertial fusion uh, in, in the lab. And with the invention of the laser, which uh, happened in the late 50s, laser is an acronym for light amplification by the stimula stimulated emission of radiation. Uh, and uh, it, that gave you a clue as to how you might be able to uh, provide the necessary photon flux. Uh, but it took about 40 years uh, of, of development in lasers before you were able to get anything that was potentially useful. And the thing that actually ended up driving the whole thing was the nuclear test ban treaty. If you recall, uh, in the, uh, uh, during the Clinton years, uh, a treaty to ban testing of nuclear weapons uh, was put in place. The U.S. agreed to uh, abide by it, but never ratified it. So uh, it, it then left the weaponeers uh, wondering what they were going to do. How were they going to find out more uh, uh, about weapons development without testing? And of course, being able to generate uh, uh, examples of these explosions by generating a photon flux in the laboratory uh, gave you a way of investigating nuclear weapons without having to test, uh, uh, without testing. That is, you made an artificial uh, mini explosion in, in the lab that uh, taught you uh, a great deal, and you thought uh, that you might also, if you uh, were successful with this, uh, be able to use it uh, as a commercial uh, energy source. So the construction of this facility to uh, uh, d make this incredibly uh, potent uh, photon beam uh, was uh, approved in 1998, and it was off to a very shaky start. It had a fourfold increase in budget, and it was supposed to be done, I think, something like to, in, in 2002, it wasn't completed till 2010, uh, and it was announced ready, and for uh, 2010 till the 5th of December uh, last year, uh, they were unable to get more energy out uh, of, of the pellet than they put into it. So. Uh, uh, I want to just say a couple of words about uh, a laser and how they can provide intense uh, pulses of light. So it's really hard to figure out how to amplify light. Uh, we know how to amplify sound and things like that, but the ability of amplifying light is a much tougher problem. And the only way we know how to do it is use a, a laser. And what you do is if you have a, uh, a, uh, an atomic system where you can make, hang, make, get some atoms to hang up, that is not decay, but have a possibility of decaying with the same energy uh, as an incident photon has on it, then this incident photon will cause this thing, this atomic level to de-excite and adds to its uh, amplitude, thereby ever increasing the power. So you just keep doing this amplification time after time after time, and the medium that you do it is you put neodymium atoms in, in big slabs of glass, and excite those neodymium uh, atoms by shining what's called a flash lamp on them. They, that excites them into a highly excited level. They decay a little bit, but then hang up in, in a state where uh, it requires an incident light beam to de-excite them. 
and so uh, and it hang it can hang up in this state for something like 300 microseconds, and you run all this energy through the laser. Uh, the, the, the laser that I'm talking about uh, ends up, if you stretch that out on length, about a mi uh, two and a half miles long. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the, the, you have this uh, uh, neodymium dope glass. You excite it with flash lamps. And uh, here's what you have to end up building in order to do it. This is the NIF. Uh, 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 a, photo, a figure of, of the NIF uh, uh, installation at the Livermore Laboratory. The area of this, and these are all the lasers, the light going back and forth in this system, this is, it has the area of three football fields. Okay, so it's an enormous uh, uh, under, undertaking. When you're, when you're done, uh, you take uh, and have a 190, uh, uh, what is it, 192 separate beams uh, 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 of this laser light all coming together. And here I show you a picture of the way this system is incident on a target chamber and the, the thing you're going to detonate is sitting in the middle of this target chamber. This target chamber is about 30 feet in diameter. So it's a really big thing. And this is just the array of laser beams uh, uh, that are coming in to uh, be focused on a point in the middle of this enormous target chamber. So you can see, boy, this is no small engineering. Uh, undertaking and it, at some level uh, it, it was amazing that uh, that uh, NIF was able to get this thing uh, to work. Now how does this thing end up causing fusion for you? Well this this is the target that you're going to focus all those beams on. This very little thing here you can see with uh, these fingers setting the scale for it, and that's a metal cylinder called a whole room. And in the center of this cylinder is a, uh, a, a thing that now the most re the test sex successfully had a diamond coating. So it's a diamond inside a diamond cylinder. <coughs> there is then frozen deuterium. Uh, a, a, a gas, and when this, all those laser beams are thrown in to this whole room, they focus, they heat up the sides of the wall of this thing, whoop, heat up the sides of the wall, and that makes an incredible uh, radiation uh, thing, but that isn't what compresses the fuel. What compresses the fuel is the fact that you've heated up this diamond on the outside, got it so hot that it blows apart, and by its blowing apart, it forces the uh, fuel inside uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, little pellet, which is about as large as a peppercorn, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, come to a sufficiently high pressure and temperature that deuterium, uh, uh, the DT fuses and you get some reaction from it. And the fact that that alpha particle that's uh, emitted can get into the, in, into the mixture, heats it up further, and so you could get more energy out of this thing than you put into it. And as I said, it's been a long, tough battle for NIF to show any encouraging results. So it, at some level, isn't surprising that, that NIF and its supporters made the most uh, of their achievements over the past year. Uh, on, on August the 28th, 2021, they measured uh, uh, something like 1.3 megajoules of energy, putting in 1.9. That's not 
uh, really so good. But finally, on the December the 5th, they got 5.13 megajoules out, with putting just 2, point, uh, 2 and a fraction uh, of megajoules in. An energy gain, an engineering triumph, scientifically m meaningful, but what does it really mean? I would say one thing is it shows you how difficult it is uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, get sufficient thermal energy into matter uh, to get these reactions to take place. Let's take a hard look at, at uh, uh, what's really going on. Uh, of course, to uh, generate that, uh, that uh, amount of energy, how much energy do they have to put into the beam? It turns out they had to put in 422 megajoules uh, uh, of energy to generate the beam to get uh, a little over one megajoule in positive energy out. Uh, that's not uh, uh, two. And what a how useful that use of megajoules sounds like, oh boy, well, there's a lot of energy there. Uh, a megajoule actually is enough energy to boil a gallon of water. Okay? So, we're a long way from doing anything, <laughs> uh, anything useful. Useful power plants have to generate uh, a gigajoule uh, of electrical energy. Uh, per second, so they're they're called gigawatt plants. So that's uh, ten to the ten to the twelfth watts uh, per second is what you have to get if you want to have a, a reasonable power power station. The uh, so and NIF is able to fire it, it. It prides itself now that they can fire it four hundred times a year. So, in round numbers, that's once a day. Yeah, so, so you say, okay, suppose we could create a setup where we could fire it ten times a second. <laughs> and to, to produce a gigawatt uh, of energy, I'd have to then make a hundred megajoule pulses, uh, 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 megajoule pulses, uh, and then with an energy excess uh, 10 times uh, per second. Each of those pulses would correspond to detonating 50 pounds of TNT. So that's something you have to deal with. 10 times a second, 50 pounds of t TNT blowing off in the middle of this, uh, your uh, commercial uh, station. And uh, <clears throat> so if you assume that you can do that, uh, and you get the efficiency up by a factor of 10, so it only takes 42 joules to create that laser pulse energy, there's still a problem. The conversion of thermal energy, so it's one thing to make heat, but if you want to convert heat to electrical energy, you can only do it at the very best at about 40% 40 uh, 40 efficiency. So, uh, so as far as I can see, they're expending 42 megajoules uh, from a wall plug to when I looked at doing that arithmetic to get 40 megajoules back. What, a, <laughs> what am I not getting? Uh, I mean, it really looks like this thing is so far away from being able to produce uh, any form of viable commercial energy, never mind thinking about how much it would cost. I didn't tell you how am I going to take all those energetic neutrons and convert them uh, usefully uh, into something that I can get the heat out of. That's, I mean, it just seems to me that's impossible. But that, of course, is not the only fission story. There's another fission option going on. Uh, it's called magnetic confinement. So there are two approaches uh, to um, how you would use DT fusion uh, for commercial energy. One is, uh, as we were talking about there, inertial confinement. And by inertial confinement, I mean uh, what I do is I get the energy into this system so fast uh, that I can catch 
uh, enough reactions to take place before it comes apart that will make useful energy for me. The other way is to try to control and contain the thing that's producing uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that energy, and uh, that's called magnetic fusion. Now, <clears throat> magnetic fusion, uh, uh, I don't want to go into it too, too deeply because it's really pretty darn uh, complicated, but it uses magnetic fields to confine this hot plasma. And this is a, a model, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, of the fusion reactor known as ITER, uh, experimental thermo, thermonuclear uh, test experiment going on. It's being built in the south of France. This looks to you harmless enough until you realize that this vacuum chamber in which the fusion, the DT gas, that's confined in here is supposed to uh, uh, take place. This is 30 feet in size. So this is an, also another enormous uh, undertaking. Uh, and uh, it is built, uh, the US claims that this thing actually costs $60 billion to build. Uh, their claim is it costs 30. Uh, but it's uh, bookkeeping, as you know, can be uh, kind of a, uh, an evasive uh, <laughs> thing. However, so there was an announcement in this business uh, a little earlier in the year, in February uh, of 2000, uh, of last year, uh, a uh, British facility, uh, the uh, Joint European Taurus, Jack, uh, release a total of 59 megajoules of energy in the form of neutrons during a five-second pulse uh, of plasma discharge uh, expressed in uh, uh, units of power. Uh, it's about 11 megawatts uh, averaged over five seconds. So remember, what you need to do is make gigawatts of this energy. So kind of like the order of a million times the, the energy uh, from this. And the previous uh, record uh, was set in 1997. So you notice the progress is a little slow in this game here. 97, uh, 25 years uh, <laughs> between uh, the, the, those uh, the, the, those uh, two results. Uh, now let's take a look at their, again, their idea of uh, how they gain this total uh, energy was uh, the very same kind of cheat that NIF was involved in. They told you about how much energy they had to put in to the plasma that was in here versus what come out came out. Not what it the energy that it took for them to generate <laughs> the uh, uh, energy that they put into that uh, into that plasma. So there, they had to put in 300 uh, megawatts uh, of power uh, to get uh, 50 megawatts uh, uh, 50 megawatts out for 59 megajoules, which uh, would be 59. Uh, well, 11 megawatts uh, over five seconds. So, but they had to put in 300 megawatts to get that. So, it really is hard yet to get the numbers uh, of what these people are actually uh, are actually doing. Uh, so, uh, uh, this gigantic. Uh, operation is a collaboration of China, the European Union, India, Japan, Korea, Russia, and the United States. So we're, this thing is supposed to take 35 years. Uh, it will not, uh, it's being built right now, uh, and uh, it uh, uh, would give rise to not generating energy itself, but could lead you to building a thing that you would call the demonstration 
fusion reactor. That's called demo. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, uh, what would it do? Uh, it, it, here's a list of the kind of things it would end up generating 500 megawatts uh, of fusion power. But the, uh, its current schedule is uh, it's now being assembled. It's already run into delays, which I'll mention briefly. Uh, it it uh, will have a first plasma in uh, something like uh, uh, 2025, uh, but they'll just be fooling around with it for 10 years before they uh, go into uh, actually you trying to run it with deuterium and tritium. So they won't start really doing stuff till 2035. This is what that facility looks like. This was a green acres, a green site in the south of France. Uh, it's an enormous undertaking. The uh, uh, facility itself, not not taking into account the whole site, was something uh, the order of sixty billion dollars. And here's where it's located, down here in the south of France. Here's Marseille and uh, the Mediterranean. So it's kind of a nice, nice site. You might like to go there and work. You're close to Nice. And, uh, nice places in the south of France. This is again a look at the size of this device. And this is a lady. This down here looking at this device. So here she be. It's easy to miss her. Uh, okay. Do you all see her? Well, there she is down there in the bottom where I have the arrow right there. And this is this monstrous thing that's supposed to create this energy. And again, uh, it has the uh, problem of uh, the way they want to talk about it is they just want to tell you about the power uh, that they being put into the reactor versus what's coming out without telling you all the energy they have to expend to get the power to put into that uh, uh, re re reactor. So uh, the uh, in, in this, uh, when this fellow uh, goes ahead and checks on what their power is, they talk about creating 500 megawatts of power. What they've actually done is a net le loss of 220 megawatts when you count what it costs to actually put the uh, assemble uh, the system together to make it work. Yes. So what's the nature of that magnetic field and how, if it's a constant magnetic field, how long and how much energy does it take to charge it? And what okay, uh, that, that's part of the problem. I really should go back uh, and uh, talk about that. Let me. So the principal magnetic field for this is generated by a series of uh, uh, toroidal magnets. Uh, that are arranged to give you a circular distribution with a magnetic field that, at least due to them, runs uh, around in straight lines in here. The plasma itself, uh, due to the current flowing in it, generates a magnetic field that uh, runs around the, uh, the plasma so that actual particles in, in, in the plasma undergo a toroidal uh, motion wearing, uh, as, as they go around in, in here, hopefully colliding uh, and uh, uh, the fact that the deuterium and tritium move with different velocities mean that the probability of their collision uh, is higher than if they were, for example, both, both deuterium. Uh, so. Uh, I didn't want to go into the complexity of uh, uh, just how a torus works. It's uh, or a tokamak works. That's what this facility is called because it's really pretty pretty complex stuff. Uh, does that? Tell you? Fine. Yeah, yeah. And, and now the real problem is, and, and thank you for 
bringing me back to it. You're making in here a plasma that's uh, at a temperature of 150 million degrees Kelvin. And these magnets, in order to be efficient, are superconducting. <laughs> so they're at four degrees Kelvin. So you have the problem of having in here a thing that's 150 million degrees and confining it, if, and the only way you can do it economically and generate strong enough fields is with superconducting coils that if you get heat into them, they go critical and, and lose their superconductivity. The magnetic field collapses, and you've got a mess uh, with all the energy that's stored in that magnetic field when it, when it collapses. So, uh, but even if you were successful, you still <laughs> are using 220 more megawatts uh, of energy than you are producing. They already have the plans for the demo site, and they want to start construction of that. Let's get that underway <laughs> before they uh, uh, have any results that would tell you whether or not the thing would, would work or not. So uh, it's a, a real problem. As I said, in late January uh, 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 of last year, the uh, French's Nuclear Safety Authority ordered a halt to the assembly of the Eater vacuum vessel after finding uh, misalignments between the welding surfaces of the first 200, uh, uh, 440 ton stainless steel uh, vessel sections. The pair, the first two of nine segments that when joined form a torus that contains the fusion plasma has been damaged in transit from South Korea where they were built. They also told the EATER organization, which manages the construction and is not affiliated with the French government, that the two meter thick construction radiological shielding that's to be in installed around the reactor is inadequate to protect personnel once experimental operation gets underway. Uh, there is concern that if they increase that shielding, uh, it would cause the total weight of the reactor to exceed the 140 thousand ton capacity of the earthquake resistant foundation. So these three issues need to be satisfactorily addressed before uh, the uh, French Nuclear Safety Administration will lift its construction hold. It's still on hold. So uh, this is a statement. Uh, so uh, uh, down at the end I make the following Kate comment. Uh, tokamaks have a very nasty technical problem. The DT burning problem uh, plasma must be at 150 million degrees Kelvin. And the adjacent superconducting toroidal magnets must operate at 4 degrees Kelvin. And there will be a whole sea of those 14.7 million electron volt neutrinos just pouring out of this, this thing. Uh, it is not clear at all how to shield the magnets from all that heat and the energetic neutrons. And also, that all that neutron kinetic energy needs to be gathered up and a 40% penalty paid to convert the resultant heat to electrical energy. To me, fission appears too difficult and hence expensive to pursue as a via commercial energy source. I would say, Light water conventional nuclear reactors are very well understood. <laughs> if their design is standardized, they could be produced at lower cost, something less than $10 billion. Nuclear waste disposal and proliferation still remain problems. Uh, but just think about whether you want to deal with that or uh, global warming. <laughs> so uh, that's. Uh, I, I'm afraid the way the nuclear energy uh, issue stacks up for me, uh, I'm not very optimistic at all uh, about the future of fusion energy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. There's one more thing before we get to comments and questions. Let me, uh, oh, where is it? Some of their stated objectives 
I don't see a ghost of a chance of them uh, uh, realizing their stated objectives. Okay. Bob, uh, John, and then yes. Several years ago, there was a big brouhaha about cold fusion at the University <laughs> of Utah. <laughs> yeah. uh, did anything, I mean, it was a hoax. I, 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 I've heard that it was a hoax or just a false hoax start. Yes, uh, could you say something about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, let me, I, I better be careful uh, 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 because uh, one of the things that to me was very alarming is chemists immediately embraced cold fusion uh, as a reality. And, and physicists said, excuse me, this is impossible. It cannot be true. And, and uh, it, it turns out, of course, it is not possible. I mean, there is no abracadabra that you can say that will cause this damn thing. Uh, to take place. There just are not the forces uh, uh, available uh, to cause fusion to take place. Uh, it was, uh, uh, to me, a, a rather sorry, uh, sorry thing uh, to see that a, a large segment of the scientific community was ready to believe it. This will show my naivete, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm having trouble uh, with what fusion energy is. Is this electrical energy? Is it heat energy? Okay. Uh, you know, what's what's coming in when we measure? What's coming out the other end? You bet. Okay. So, uh, good question, Don. Everything that's been talked about with regard to fusion energy right now is in producing thermal energy in the form of those energetic neutrons. The problem of how you would take that bath of hot energetic neutrons and convert them to useful thermal energy uh, is uh, a, a problem where they see themselves using a liquid that is molten lead and lithium uh, and, uh, and you then use that, you then try to cool that, uh, and in cooling it you take uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you run water, something like water through it, use that steam to drive a turbine, and, and uh, the efficiency that you can convert ter thermal energy uh, at several thousand degrees uh, into electrical energy is about 40%. That's the best you can do. The conversion then of, uh, of uh, into electrical energy, is that figured into uh, what goes in versus what comes out? Uh, only in, when you do that complete arithmetic that I showed you uh, in the case of the, that man, Stephen Krebitz, uh, who, who did it for ITER and said, wait a minute, you guys are not producing energy, you're using energy. And so when you put that, that 40% is a big penalty. Very big penalty, and especially when you're talking about quantities, you know, that are involving things like gigawatts. Because that's the scale that you need to produce the energy at. It's going to be useful. Uh, along these lines, uh, the Fusion projects were always held up as one of those projects where if you ask somebody when it would they achieve their goal, they'd say 20 years out, and you'd ask them 20 years later, and the answer was always the same, 20 years out. <laughs> and uh, it's applied to other projects that are deemed equally unlikely. Though it, until the turn of the century, it used to say the same thing about our artificial intelligence. We'll get artificial intelligence in 20 years. So it looks like we may be making more progress in getting artificial intelligence than fusion. Oh, you bet. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what was the barrier? See, uh, as long as there are not intrinsic barriers to things, uh, I can see that you can make progress. Uh, the uh, artificial intelligence, I could see, uh, really in involved just being able to make better silicon chips uh, uh, handle data, fa process things faster, and, and there was no limit, no limit 
to that, though we might be eventually getting to the point where chips are getting so small that you can't really get anywhere uh, in that direction. But then there's quantum computing. And so, uh, you know, you just have to make sure that there aren't intrinsic physical barriers between yourself and what you're trying to accomplish. And yeah. So you would advise uh, policymakers that we've reached a dead end as far as fusion is concerned. Yes. And that nothing further should be pursued in that direction. Because you, you use the word unless, and now unless suggests that there's the possibility of something different happening than right. what we're experiencing now. So I, 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 don't, I don't know yeah. if you're saying stop, or whether you're saying caution, or whether you're saying, uh, well... Well, I mean, I, 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 it's, a, it's a momentous decision to decide to just stop something. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, so uh, uh, you, you notice my reluctance uh, in doing it. Yeah. Uh, I, I can simply tell you how unlikely uh, I, I, I see success. Uh, I certainly... I cannot imagine uh, anything happening within the next 50 years mm -hmm. that would make uh, fusion uh, possible at, at, at a cost uh, that would be competitive uh, with uh, what we're currently doing either with renewables or nuclear reactors. But, and if that's a fact, that it can't happen within 50 years, the question then is whether to stop completely pursuing the avenues that lead to acceptable results from fusion, or you know, keep trying and see what you can come up well, with? Well, uh, stay in touch. So the Europeans uh, 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 seem to be willing to uh, uh, push ahead with this. France, as you know, is uh, uh, actually, uh, because of their dependence on nuclear reactors, is actually weathering uh, the, the uh, issue in Europe right now better than any other country. Uh, something like 80% of the electrical energy in, in France comes from reactors. So they had none of the dependence on natural gas that uh, other countries had. Uh, uh, it wasn't so clear uh, that, that, that that great dependence on uh, nuclear reactors was a good thing for France. But under the current circumstance, it turned out, well, it turned out to be a, a kind of good bet. So, boy, it's so hard to tell. And one other thing that I haven't really mentioned is they have a big problem with tritium. Uh, tritium is, as I said, is radioactive uh, and has a half-life of something like 13 years. And, and uh, most of the tritium that we, that's a, around now for use is produced by the Canadian CAMDU reactors, uh, which use deuterium as the water moderator. And, and so they get tritium uh, out uh, when they process uh, that uh, that that water. They're planning to shut those down. They've been running now for about 60 years, and apparently are uh, coming to a close. So that source of deuterium of tritium uh, will be vanishing, and unless they get a a really good way of producing tritium. Uh, say, at a, at from these uh, uh, fusion reactors, uh, if, the, if you do some very careful book accounting, they can produce uh, about enough tritium to keep themselves running if nothing goes wrong. If they have a breakdown, they're screwed because the tritium is decaying away on you, and so if you're taking a couple of years to uh, uh, fix, uh, fix the thing, uh, the, you'll run down, you'll be running out of tritium, and 
uh, it isn't clear how you could start the facility up unless you had a supply of tritium, tritium standing by. So there are just a host of really nasty problems that, I, that these people have to face that I haven't gone into. Over the uh, last 50 years or so, we've had uh, big, huge investments in the space program. Yes. Uh, there have been critics who said that that's wasted money and we ought to stop. Uh, they're also obviously supporters. Uh, one of the things that has uh, encouraged a lot of people is the spin-off knowledge. Yeah. That uh, uh, other things that uh, seem to provide benefits that weren't originally calculated in the investment. Uh, do you see that all happening in this uh, vision environment? Well, uh, there were a, a, early on, there were many fallouts that were beneficial to, to the laser world <coughs> from the construction of NIF. Uh, a lot of laser development went on that was ended up being quite useful uh, to other sec sectors of the economy. I see nothing in, in, the, in the ITER program that is uh, uh, a beneficial fallout. It's, uh, it's industry at a level uh, you know, we've never done this before, and that's championed a as a reason for going ahead and doing it, rather than realizing, of, oh my God, what an obstacle we're facing. Uh, uh, so, uh, I don't think there's been much realism uh, in, 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 in looking at that, but uh, the, the issue of uh, fallouts from the uh, uh, NIF program, uh, especially in lasers, was really very important. Thanks. Okay. Um, I do have one sort of a comment, uh, what occurred to me, and wondering if anyone has bothered to calculate the amount of solar energy involved in growing a tree and a certain volume of wood, and the energy that can be derived from chopping up that wood and burning it in the stove. Is the solar energy vastly larger than what we we can get? Well, I, 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 what, what do you want to do with the carbon? Well, that's it. I was just wondering if, if you know, being um, oh. another physical barrier to having an efficient energy source, is that something that's been with us since we first crawled down out of trees and started burning? Well, I, I, mean, I, I, I think the thing to realize is just how much energy the sun shines on us. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the total amount of energy that we produce is a small fraction of the energy of the total solar energy incident on the Earth. And a little tiny sliver of it gets captured in the form of plants making. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. How? Yeah, something relevant to that. Uh, the Industrial Revolution began by burning wood. And in Britain, they started running out of trees very fast. And then they switched to coal, and we made a pact with the devil, and we've been on fossil energy ever since. Um, although we're wasting all that solar energy. Well, <laughs> one way to look at it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gathering it up as best we can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, getting it in useful form is challenging. Yes, I know, but compared to using solar energy or using fusion energy, which would which would you bet on? One word. Solar. Solar, oh, solar yeah. of course. Yeah. Solar, solar and wind are wonderful. The only problem is they're, in a sense, not reliable. Uh, one depends on, you know, the uh, good weather, and the other depends on good wind, and, and uh, you need something uh, where you produce energy, uh, and you can flip a switch, and on it comes. Yes. So the problem really then is storing it. Yeah. Well, and, if you are, or if you, if you could where, make so much yeah. excess energy from those uh, variable resources that you could. Uh, uh, store it up and then and have then access it, to it. it as that needed. would be great, but yeah. typically, so, far, so I, far I don't think we found anything. Well, it just occurs to me, wouldn't that be a much more worthwhile thing to spend zillions of dollars on? Yeah. <laughs> well, Don wants to say something. 
this is just a comment, but really what we're talking about is big, big, big science here. And we have a lot of problems, uh, that, uh, space travel, global warming, all kinds of things in biology. And it seems to me we have people uh, deciding on where that money is going to be spent uh, that don't have science backgrounds to be able to make those decisions. Yes. Certainly. Oh, that's certainly true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's no, uh, no, I, 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 I will, no, no, stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, enjoy the rest of your birthday, Jerry. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>